Hello, everybody. Welcome to our webinar today. I'm uh, John Spencer, the uh, founder of the Space Tourism Society and with Allison Dollar, co-founder of the Space Tourism Conference. Uh, we're very happy you're all with us today and we're very, very happy our friend Frank White is with us to share uh, his perspective on the overview uh, effect. Uh, we also wanna thank Ivan Rosenberg for hosting what we're doing and he is the executive director of the uh, Aerospace and Defense uh, Forum. So what we're gonna do today is a little introduction, a little news from the space frontier, and then uh, we'll get into our discussion with Ivan, I'm sorry, with uh, Frank, and then we'll uh, leave some time for some good questions. So um, some good news going on right now. Of course, there's webinar guidelines, please follow these, turn off your uh, mic and your video. Uh, the interesting news, all focused on the space experience uh, frontier, is that uh, Axiom Space, who is planning to add modules to the International Space Station, uh, has just completed a $130 million round of funding, which rounds out their funding to date to $150 million. Uh, our friends at Space Perspective late last year closed a $7 million round for their space experience venture of taking people to the stratosphere in a, high, in a balloon and beautiful gondola. Uh, and today at 12.55 Los Angeles time, uh, the per NASA Perseverance rover is supposed to land on the red planet. So uh, we should know if it made it okay by about 1.15 LA time. And we really appreciate NASA scheduling the landing for just after our webinar. Thanks guys. Uh, we also have the upcoming Space Tourism Conference webinar, which will be, uh, <laughs> hold on, of course someone's calling. Um, let's ignore that. The uh, conference is gonna start on April 28th at 10 in the morning until two. Uh, and then it'll go April 29th, 10 in the morning until two both days. Our program is on our website, uh, which you can see. And then uh, we're also selling tickets now, Thank which will basically go for not only the Space, Space Tourism Space Conference 2021, but also 2022. So you get a double whammy for uh, ticket buying now. Uh, now let's get into what we're here for today. I've known Frank for over 30 years. He's one of those people who has been dedicated to human humanity moving outward into the solar system. He's been in the trenches with all of us for decades. And he's been looking at one of the more important parts of humanity moving outward. And that is what it all means to do so. So Frank, um, thank you very much for being with us. Please come online and go for it. John, thank you so much. It's great to be here. As you said, uh, we've known each other for a very, very long time. And uh, <clears throat> we've seen the space movement evolve and grow and develop. <clears throat> to the point where it is today. I remember in uh, 1957, October 3rd, nobody knew the next day everything would change when uh, Sputnik would be launched and we'd enter the first space age. Here we are today, <clears throat> and unlike that time when nobody really knew what was gonna happen, we're all very well aware that a human spacecraft is going to land on Mars. So. Who knows what the next 30, 40 years will look like, but it's gonna be exciting. What this seminar webinar is about is the space experience. John has popularized the idea of the space experience economy. My work is all on the astronaut experience, uh, past, present, and future. And we thought we'd just get you right into it. I'd like to show you a video it's a portion of an interview I conducted at Johnson Space Center in 2019 uh, with Reed Wiseman. And uh, the interviews I began doing there in 2019 have evolved into a really amazing NASA series called Down to Earth. So let's start with that video and then we'll pick it up with the story of the overview effect. Ivan, would you uh, show us the video? Thank you. 
I had looked at pictures on social media and pictures in NASA archives of the Earth so many times, I actually started to get worried. What if I get up there and it's just like the pictures? I mean, uh, that's going to be weird if, if that's the thing where I'm like, oh, it's just like the pictures. I'm ready to go home now. And then on the Soyuz, my launch vehicle, I launched with the Russians. And uh, on my Soyuz, when I first got a chance to look out my little window, which is about right here at the Earth, uh, there's something about looking out a round window at the curvature of the Earth that makes it just more pronounced and, and really makes it have a huge impact. I just had this feeling like I was way up high looking down and we were over the ocean and the blues that I saw, it was, I mean, it was ridiculous. I, I'd never imagined in my entire life getting to see something that beautiful. It was so far into the human mind to look at that, to see that total black of space, to see the earth highlighted that way. And then I got to see a sunset. I had one piece of paper that had a picture of my kids on it and a few of my flight data file uh, burn times on it. But I, wrote, I just took a pencil and I drew like 15 curved lines and I just wrote light blue, darker blue, pink, purple, dark purple, dark, dark purple, all the way down to the surface of the earth at sunset because the scale of looking at a sun refracting through the atmosphere, it blew me away and no picture captures that. There's no high enough dynamic range of a photo to capture what the human can see. So that first look outside completely sidelined me. I had a GoPro and I made a recording to my brother of no matter how much it costs in, in the future, come do this. You have to come do this. I mean, it's amazing. Over my six months in space, getting to look at the earth every single day, it shows you something different. Every day it shows you that it's alive. It's a being just like we are. We're guests on this planet. Um, and it is, it's our mother, it's our father, it's our starship cruising around the sun in the middle of the solar system. There was never a moment that I looked out the window and didn't immediately grab a camera to take a picture of something that our planet was doing. It always surprised me, it's always made me so. I'm a pilot, I'm not a scientist, I'm not a psychiatrist, I'm not a poet, but certainly when you're in lower orbit, looking down at the earth, it doesn't matter if you're a physicist, a school teacher, a stay-at-home parent, um, or maybe you just backpack your whole life. If you look out, you're gonna have a magical experience in your own way, for certain. All right, <clears throat> so that is a really good rendition of the experience of being in orbit, or in some cases, of course, astronauts have gone to the moon. And uh, as I was watching that, uh, the point that came up for me is it's an amazing experience. And for so many years, you had to be someone like Neil a pretty incredible person uh, to win the competition to be an astronaut. We are entering an era where that is no longer true. Uh, we're entering a period when the only element that is going to prevent everyone here from having the experience he described is finances. And over time, I think it's very, very clear that as the space tourism business evolves, like any other business, that cost will diminish and more and more of us will be able to have the experience. Uh, John, are you there? I am back. Okay. So, uh, if you'd like, that, that was actually, that particular interview was not the beginning of my story, but closer to the current day. Right. And maybe what we'd like to do is start at the beginning of the overview effect. Yeah, very much so. Uh, the story of how you perceive this um, is really interesting. And would you please share that in some detail with our uh, attendees? Yeah. Well, first of all, it's a... It's an, another experience, and that's the important aspect of it. Sometimes people don't understand it. Uh, they 
think the idea of the overview effect was something I developed sitting at my desk uh, writing, or maybe I started interviewing astronauts because I was interested in them. But that isn't how it happened, and that's important. And that's also why it's a theory as well as a uh, term. Now, many of you who are here are friends of mine. I'm glad you're here, and you probably know the story. Uh, but I hope you'll bear with me because not everybody has heard it. Credit where it's due, I was involved with the Space Studies Institute in the late 70s and early 80s. Jerry O'Neill is, is a mentor of mine and a hero of mine. And if you don't know about Jerry, he was the person who proposed the radical idea that the best place for space communities was not on a planetary surface, but that we should be building these freestanding communities between the Earth and the Moon. I was fascinated with that idea, and I was thinking about it constantly. And one day I was flying west and thinking about it and looking out the window, and I had what can only be described as an epiphany as I looked down at the Earth uh, from whatever height we were. And I said, oh, okay, if I lived in one of those habitats, I would always have an overview. I would see the Earth as a whole system, complete, interrelated, everything's connected, we're all in this together. And the idea of the overview effect came to me. And I thought, these people in the future will just philosophically start at a place where we're struggling to get to. Uh, we're just not there because we live on the surface. We haven't seen this. And so being trained as a social scientist, as an undergraduate, as soon as I had a chance, I called NASA and I said, uh, I really need to introduce as many astronauts as I can, preferably all of them. And uh, the public affairs guy thought that was really funny. He informed me that they were quite busy, the astronauts. Uh, <laughs> but he said, uh, if you come to Houston, you can interview two astronauts. And that wasn't going to be enough, I knew, but of course, I was grateful and I said I would. I interviewed uh, Jeff Hoffman, and uh, Jeff and I have stayed in touch ever since. He is uh, involved in the MOXIE experiment that's on the Mars mission today. And I interviewed Don Lin, and he gave me a great interview. But the PA guy said, why don't you interview retired astronauts? And I'd never thought of that. I started interviewing retired astronauts, and that gave me a total of 16 astronauts. And then I had a book contract, and I published the book. And here's the distinction I want to make, John. What I said about space community members, that's a hypothesis. The interviews became the data. And a theory doesn't mean it's something invalid or speculative, it means you have a hypothesis and you've done research to confirm it. Well, that's what the overview effect is. It's a theory and it, it evolves. I've now interviewed 41 astronauts. I'm adding to the information base. And I'm very gratified to know that many other people have decided that interviewing astronauts is really important. Uh, including NASA. My friends at NASA are now uh, spending more and more time on that. So the other important part about a theory is it can change. If we get new data, we can change it. If I may say one more thing, and then we can uh, segue to a different conversation, and that is that um, something happened when I started interviewing astronauts because they are not space community members. They weren't born on an O'Neill settlement. They left the surface. They saw the Earth from a distance, and it was a bit of a shock. So, you know, what I was thinking was that view of the Earth would be ordinary to these future space people. But for astronauts, it's not, just like it wouldn't be for you and me. And so, you know, the, the hypothesis changed, or maybe there's a new hypothesis. 
And a lot of people are excited about this new hypothesis because there's something more current about it. And that is, you know, this is a pretty good experience. Uh, if more people could have this experience and see what Neil saw, they might come back to Earth and behave differently. They might be more able to tackle global problems. You know, it might really benefit the Earth to have more people go into space. And John, that should be music to your ears. Right. What else? <laughs> What else could we say about space tourism? I will say just one other thing for you. I've started interviewing future space uh, astronauts, people who have tickets on Virgin Galactic. And the other big change is astronauts, even today, they don't go to experience the overview effect. Now, they go for other reasons, but their colleagues are whispering to them, don't forget to look out the window. It's pretty incredible. They're still not going for that. Whereas Virgin Galactic, Blue Origin, Space Perspective, SpaceX, they know about the overview effect. And we now have a whole cadre of people just waiting to go for that one purpose. So that is exciting. And that hasn't happened yet either, but that will happen sooner in our lifetime than people living permanently uh, between the Earth and the Moon or on the Moon or on Mars. So space tourism is right at the center of that. And what I want to emphasize, and then I'll be quiet and let you ask another question, you know, space tourism is not just for the space tourist, it's for the world. And uh, that's what astronauts say. Astronauts say, I didn't do this for me, I've got to come back and share this because it's really an important message about who we are and where we are in the universe. That's exactly right. Um, and we're seeing more and more people from diverse backgrounds and on an international basis wanting to create the opportunity for themselves, but their families <laughs> and other people to go to space to have that unique uh, life enhancing uh, experience. <laughs> And Frank, I have a couple of questions that we'll, we'll move on. But when you've interviewed the astronauts and cosmonauts, yeah. um, many of them, I, you've told me, say they want to go back. Mm -hmm. and, and there's a, a, a lure, a, a physical desire to do so. Can you talk about that a little? Yeah, you know, this is one of the mysteries that requires more research. It really does, John. The space environment is hostile to human organisms or any organism from the Earth. We all know that. It's a vacuum. Uh, the astronauts enjoy zero gravity, but you know they have to exercise two hours a day just to keep their organs from completely adapting. And uh, it would be almost impossible for them to come back to the planet. Uh, the body looks at the situation and says, I've got to change to be successful here. So it's, it's not a friendly environment. It's inherently dangerous. And if you're on the International Space Station, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty minimalist. Uh, you're an architect. You've seen it. Um, and there are not a lot of creature comfort, comforts there. And yet, I have heard more than one astronaut talk about how comfortable they are. They're comfortable there. It feels like home. It, you know, it's easy to talk about the Earth as the home planet, but there's this kind of reversal, and, and it makes me wonder, is the universe actually our home? When people talk about why are we going away from the Earth, which is so friendly and nurturing to us, are we in some way being attracted is there something going on in evolution that is attracting us there? I don't know what it is exactly, but Al Sacco Jr. was an astronaut who told me, I'm going to reveal to you the astronaut secret. And it's something all the astronauts know. 
And that is that we're all members of, of a whole human family. And we are not just citizens of the earth. We are citizens of the universe. That's a provocative concept. And uh, Mae Jemison, who I have not interviewed, but I've been on panels with her, she actually has been quoted as saying something like, you know, before I went, I, I heard about the overview effect and the earth and all of that. And uh, I felt really at home in the universe and I felt I belong there uh, as much as anybody else or anything else. And yes, the astronauts tend to uh, miss it, want to go back. And uh, I think most astronauts, I haven't really studied this, so this is not, don't take this to the bank, but I think many of the astronauts cease to be an astronaut because of family or, uh, you know, other, other reasons, not because they're tired of going uh, into space. I think it's more personal, uh, uh, commitments and and uh, priorities like that. But it, it is an area we need to look at more, which is what is it about this environment which is so starkly different from the earth not only attracts people, you could say, oh, that's for the adventure, but why do they feel at home? Why do they enjoy it so much? It's a future book, I guess, for somebody yeah, and what's interesting is the diversity of people going uh, from different countries and different backgrounds is widening their range of perspectives and their cultural issues are becoming more apparent uh, that we're kind of universal creatures, different mm -hmm. cultures, but have certain innate feelings about life and about presence and so forth. Mm -hmm. On that term, have you noticed <clears throat> in your interviews any real difference between uh, men astronauts and lady astronauts in their perspective? No, I, uh, <clears throat> I have not. Uh, I have asked some of the female astronauts, some of the women, is there a gender difference? And so far, nobody has said yes. It is not something I've focused on intensely. Mm -hmm. I may not be asking the right questions, but I have asked the question directly uh, to, uh, you know, a number of women. And so far, I haven't gotten anybody to say, yeah, there really is a difference. And, you know, that's really remarkable because what we're seeing, and it's not just my research, but other research, seems to be confirming that the overview effect does transcend cultural, gender, and other differences. And of course, that's what we're excited about. And, you know, the most recent time I was down in uh, Houston, and I, I interviewed three astronauts who were on the International Space Station. I've never interviewed any astronauts while they were actually there. But one of the things they emphasized a lot was no matter how different that person is next to you, no matter how different they look, act, or what they have to say, you're both human, and that really transcends those differences. And, you know, I just think this is a message we need. Um, it, it's not meant to wipe out differences. I, I don't think any astronaut comes back and says the differences aren't there. But what I've tried to say before is we, we get a, a picture of ourselves as diverse. We're very diverse, but within a context of unity. So the diversity is, exists, and in many cases, it's a beautiful thing. But what holds it all together is uh, a unity of who we are and where we are and the planet that we live on, this spaceship Earth. Yeah, I, as a young designer, I was, I had my epiphany when I realized uh, from Buckminster Fuller, a great design scientist, that we all live on Spaceship Earth. Yeah. It had that, to me, 
my perspective changed and it yeah. became much wider, much more beautiful, much more varied. Uh, and mm -hmm. I'm always incredibly thankful uh, for that. And one of the things that's interesting is as our space economy grows and the space experience becomes more focused uh, with more investment, but also more attention and design, the range of people going is gonna multiply pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. Our friends at Space Perspective have the concept of the big air, uh, the balloon, taking a beautiful gondola with eight passengers uh, into the stratosphere. Where you clearly okay. see the curvature of the earth, where you see the dark sky. And we've been having some discussions about families going mm -hmm. to have that experience with children. Yeah. And have you had a chance to think much about children going to space to have that experience and what that might be uh, like for them? Well, one thing I, I have uh, thought about, uh, and incidentally, I, I do plan to have the uh, spaceship Neptune experience. Right. Uh, I'm working on that, and uh, we could talk more about it if you like. But... Uh, yeah, I haven't thought too much about it, except as we think about something like groups of people going. Um, because, you know, it hasn't been something you could think about. I mean, you've had to think about it. astronauts who are really incredibly accomplished. Now, I don't like the term, but we're thinking about ordinary people. And of course, the next step is to think about families. But I think it has to have a remarkable impact for the good for that to happen early in life. And the reason is we are so shaped by our early childhood experiences. And as a child, we've all been there. Everybody here knows what I'm talking about. When you're a child, you don't have all the preconceptions that we have as adults. Um, you know, we talk about this as a shift in worldview. When you're a child, you're beginning to form your worldview. How do, how do you see the world? Positive, negative, expanding? Um, is it something that's really wonderful and incredible, or is it something scary? My thought is that what, what you and I are talking about is how is space tourism, how is the overview effect going to change human evolution? And what could be more important than for kids to have the experience and to have the experience with their family? So uh, I think it's going to be really profound. And again, as we're talking, there's so many areas of new research that we need to do. But I think that's one. Yes, and those kids that do get to go uh, will talk to other kids. Right. And what's, what I find very encouraging is with the internet and other communications, a lot of young people, kids, think of themselves more and more as world citizens. Yeah. They have, they have friends all over the world. Yeah. And I think that's really useful from a communication standpoint in the same way the overview effect and space tourism will give people that physical, visual uh, impression that we're all in this together at Spaceship Earth and so forth. Yeah. And I think those are critical things for building relationships. And recently we were talking that um, back in 2019, on the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 landing on the moon, that celebration was worldwide. And people around the world were saying, wow, 50 years ago, we, we mm -hmm. went to the moon. And I've always thought that is such an important aspect of the space experience of us moving outward into the solar system. We, humanity, is moving outward. And the more we can talk about that and widen the discussion, the better. And the more people we bring in to that discussion, the better and more diverse that discussion is. So your pioneering work in the overview effect and what you're doing now, I think is critical. I think your human space program is really exciting and important. And can you please tell us more about that? Yeah, I'd love to. Um, you learn a lot when you write a book, John. You know that. <laughs> you've, written, right. you've written your own books. As I got to the end of uh, the first edition of The Overview Effect, 
it became so obvious that this was an important experience, but exploring a universe was too big a job for one country, one space program, one company. It should be a human adventure. Um, and at a critical moment, my friend Bruce Shackleton gave me an article that talked about central projects. Central projects are long-term projects of something really, really hard to do, like building Gothic cathedrals all over Europe or Apollo. And it engages the best energies of an entire society. Um, and I thought, that's a great idea. We, we need to have a human space program for all of humanity to explore the universe. And I, I laid it out as lasting for a millennium from 2000 to 3000. And, uh, you know, the, the whole idea was it would be a, a way for all of us to get involved in this adventure. So that idea was in the first edition, the second edition, and the third edition, and nobody chose to do it. So I decided, well, I think we have to do it ourselves. Uh, today, the Human Space Program is the Human Space Program, Inc. Uh, we're a nonprofit incorporated in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. We're seeking 501c3 status. Uh, there's a dedicated team of volunteers, some of whom may be here today. And right now, what we're focused on is what we call a central project to ensure the sustainable, inclusive, and ethical evolution into the solar ecosystem. To make a long story short, because I know we're short on time, our purpose is to create a comprehensive plan for exploring and developing the solar system that will take into account all the big questions, ethical, environmental, economic. And we wanna remind everybody <laughs> that the earth is part of the solar system. So it's, a, it's an idea of some of us leaving the planet without leaving it behind. And you know, the last thing I would say is this is not rocket science in the sense that on the earth, we have developers and we have planners, right? You need both. If you just have planners, you're never gonna get anything done. And if you just have developers, things are gonna be chaotic. So our view is we've got a lot of developers and we respect them and honor them. We wanna be the planners working with them to uh, create a, an, an evolution into the solar system that we'll all be proud of as humanity and as human beings. Yeah, what I love is that you're thinking long-term big picture and humanity in the past building the pyramids or you said the cathedrals were projects that a whole country, a city, a people could get behind and believed in and participate in and aspire to be there when it's completed or be part of making it happen. And those are good team building human things to do, to care about something, to believe in the future and to be working for it. Yeah. I want to add uh, just one more thing or so, and then I'd like Allison to come in and start uh, dealing with the questions. I'm sure we have a lot of good questions. Is that Frankie, you and I've talked about this a lot, that we're going to eventually have a wider range of people going to space people who work in space. Yeah. I get asked questions all the time. Well, I can't afford 40, $50 million to go to space. How am I ever going to do it? And I always say work in space mm. and they, they all stop and start processing in their mind because it changes. It's that perspective change work mm. in space because when we have orbital super yachts and we have a resort on the moon, these are projects of the future. We need people to work there to cook the fine meals, to clean the place, to pilot it, to, to, to provide entertainment. So I encourage people to think in their own ways of how they might be able to work in space. Mm -hmm. And eventually with our groups, we're gonna have a space academy, not in the traditional sense of a military academy or training to fly vehicles, but how do you cook in space? What is space fashion? What is space entertainment? Uh, what are space hairstyles? So what we wanna do 
is get people excited about their own creativity in helping to create the space lifestyle, the space experience, and helping humanity move outward into the solar system in a very compassionate, joyful, mm -hmm. and fun way, essentially. And that, that works so well with the overview effect and space experience and the space experience economy. So uh, this is great, Frank. Uh, Allison, can you come in and help us out with the questions? Hey, everybody. Hey, Good to see you today. I'm going to, uh, I won't keep my video on the whole time because I think that's distraction, distracting, but I will come off and on and look at the questions. Um, Frank, one, I think a nice segue from how you guys just wrapped up was in your travels, so to speak, um, among these interviews and the study and everything that you have done, have you found that uh, organized religion and formal religion as a perspective has changed anyone who has had the overview effect in their uh, perception of the overview effect? Mm. That's a great question. Um, I have only talked to one astronaut who might be considered to have changed his religious views. Uh, that would be Edgar Mitchell. Um, you know, Edgar Mitchell was raised in a fairly traditional religious background. I think by the time he flew, he was no longer practicing at all. But uh, he did have a profound shift uh, of awareness on the way back from the moon. And I know that he didn't say this to me, as I recall, but I believe he said it in Omni magazine, something like God exists, but it's not the God we think of and uh, consciousness is the bridge so he had a broadening perspective and he told me he did tell me that the difference in how people uh, process the experience was largely how open they were to it most of the people i've talked to have said that they're religious and i focus on religious not spiritual but their religious practice was not changed by the experience. Um, and some people, some astronauts did talk about how their religious or spiritual background affected them. I know uh, that in the, uh, the book, uh, A Man on the Moon, there is a discussion of one astronaut, and I don't recall the name, who felt that um, God or Jesus had guided him to a specific rock they were looking for. I may not have the details quite right, but the, the idea that his religious upbringing affected the way he perceived what he was doing there uh, was very strong. So that is probably something that's going to change as more people fly. I, I would expect to see more of an evolution in how people's religious and spiritual practices are affected by being in orbit, going to the moon, or, you know, John, John nailed it. Um, what about people living permanently out there? They may create completely new religious practices. It, it's, not, it's not unlikely. Well, what, along those lines, what about other kinds of professionals uh, who already are in the space space, like astronomers or others that are um, more related to data collection and the prosaic aspects? Have you found that they have also experienced the overview effect the same way, sort of the obverse of the other, other side, the rel religiosity on the one hand and the, the very uh, linear, pragmatic, uh, stripped away on the other. Well, when you, when you speak of astronomers, do you mean astronomers who became astronauts or those who... Yes, yes. People who yeah. have experienced it, but then had other kinds of like more strict scientific training that were not religious. Did they... Wh what were those differences in that spectrum? Yeah. Um, well, you know, one of the one of the interesting experiences it would be Jeff Hoffman, who was trained in astrophysics at Harvard, 
And he, he did tell me that to some extent, he felt very well prepared for being in space because he had been an astronomer and it was more or less his work, his job. Um, but at the same time, Jeff did have a pretty significant experience that he describes to some extent in the great film overview by Planetary Collective, where he, you know, he talks about um, floating, uh, floating within the shuttle and looking at the Earth, and he actually started doing yoga, and uh, he had a, an incredible experience of unity and oneness with everything around him. It was the kind of experience that I think one would call spiritual. Um, Jeff didn't call it that. Uh, similarly, uh, you know, when Edgar Mitchell came back from the moon, he went around and asked people, I don't know what happened to me. I don't know. I felt at one with the entire universe. What? What is it? What's it called? And somebody said, uh, it's Nerva Kalpa Samadhi that you experience, which is a form of enlightenment. You know, Edgar was trained uh, as a physicist, as a test pilot. And, uh, you know, Edgar said to me something I've repeated over and over again, which is, we all had the same experience, but the way we processed it and the way we communicate it is different because we're all different. Mm -hmm. So, the, you know, I, I really thought when I started this, everybody would describe the same thing. And then I was surprised that it was all different. And then I found commonalities in, in the experience. But I think it's wonderful that it's the same experience, but everybody expresses it according to their own unique uh, way of being, their own unique training and background. Well, it, it, uh, the physiology of it may be similar too, though. If you're getting a state of bliss to some degree, and the yoga is a great analogy there with the breathing and the flow, uh, right. but it, which is also measurable um, from a medical standpoint, like the physiology of that. Is there, what is your methodology uh, overall too? Is it you um, in tracking this? Because I believe you said there was some sociological methodology uh, in your approach, or can you explain that a little bit? <laughs> well, you know, it's funny thing. I started out thinking like a social scientist and I thought I needed a huge um, database and I was going to do all these rigorous analyses. And then I was fortunate to get a book contract and then I had to produce the book based on 16 interviews. So I did, not, I did not have a strict methodology except looking for what are the common experiences. For example, everyone I think has probably heard by now that astronauts are surprised that there are no borders or boundaries on the earth, even though they knew that before they went. So things like that emerged. Uh, but that has been my methodology, has been to add more and more interviews, and I always learn something new. I always hear something I haven't heard before. And so that has been the approach I've taken, uh, which has been to look for common patterns and common themes. And, you know, it, it really is interesting to see that there are such that there are these common patterns and themes, and yet there is a tremendous variety in what stands out for people as well. Now, I would just say there are other researchers who've applied more rigorous analyses. The University of Brit British Columbia uh, looked at reports by 125 astronauts, cosmonauts, and other space travelers, and they applied a very rigorous uh, sociological analysis, and they detected a, a fundamental change in values across the database from uh, more focused on personal achievement to more universal and global values. So that, in a way, was another approach that I think really confirmed the whole idea of the overview effect.
How many people would you say are in your field of, of your specialty globally? Because <laughs> it seems well, like, it seems, I mean, I might be wrong, but I would only say, think a couple of dozen, right? Not, there's not. Well, I think we'd be surprised how many people are interested in this. One thing John and I have talked about is there really is a movement worldwide right now uh, to bring the overview effect down to earth. Um, you know, there is this belief in the second hypothesis that if we could, through virtual reality or space tourism, if we could reproduce this experience in more people, it would make a difference. Uh, it would make a difference to life on Earth. You know, Dan Curry is here. Uh, Dan is a founding member of the Overview Institute. I don't know if Dan wants to say he's in my field or not, <laughs> but, uh, you know, he's very interested in this topic and he's very involved with it. Uh, Steve Finnegan is here. Steve certainly is, is uh, interested and believes in, in the movement, I would say. Uh, Christina Rasmussen is here. Uh, Christina has been an incredible help uh, in, in working on this topic. Uh, as I look around here, I could name other people. You know who you are. Uh, but I, I, Allison, I would, I, would compare it, uh, I would compare it to something that happened last year. I was asked to give a talk at the International Astronautical Congress by Daniela DePaulis, who's an artist who's interested in the overview effect. And the talk was on artists who are actively trying to share the overview message. And I started going online and doing research. And Allison, I was amazed how many artists are focused on the overview effect. And, you know, um, one of the things I'm trying to do right now for the Kepler Space Institute is look at the impact of the overview effect worldwide. And I'm going to do the same kind of research. And I have a feeling I am going to have more and more people, find more and more people who are in this field by their own definition. And I'm so excited about that because I didn't want to be the only one. I right. wanted the book. I wanted the book to become a movement, and it really has. And in the chat, people are putting up information about virtual reality and its use in bringing out the experience. So it's happening out there. Well, I would think some of these that because I know in our previous conversations you had made a distinction of Earth-based experiences as not generating the full true overview effect. However, clearly they're still transform, uh, transporting and transformative enough to be part of the, and I'm talking in terms of uh, the economy and the business side of the tourism that we are obviously advocates um, advocating. Sure. Um, but, but wouldn't you say, or would you want to make an observation regarding this about generating demand uh, and a notion of what it could be, because we do see those things linked. I, I am a, I'm bullish on virtual reality as a way of communicating the overview effect. I mean, it, it's much more accessible financially. It's much more accessible per, personally. And I believe it can, in fact, generate a lot of the experience. I have said more than once that I believe the overview effect experience should be seen as a human right. Everybody mm -hmm. should have it. Uh, and when we see other things that are human rights, we figure out ways for them to have it. So that's pretty radical, Frank. I love that. <laughs> I mean, if, yeah. you know, if I were having my journalist hat right on, not on right now, I would have that as a headline. Well, it should be a headline. And as I've said before, you know, um, uh, it, it, it's something where uh, Bernie Sanders has simply said over and over again, health care is a human right. It is not a privilege. And he keeps saying it and saying it and saying it with that incredible Brooklyn accent. And after a while, people said, well, I guess you're right, Bernie. Uh, so I'm going to keep saying it and uh, because I do believe it. 
And I think, you know, one way to do it is through virtual reality. And I, if we had time, I could name three or four people for you who are using virtual reality to bring the overview effect down to earth right now today. It's not a future plan. It's happening. Yeah, today. well, we know them. And as you know, I, that's how John and I connected originally because I come out of the media, media sector. I was going to say space. No. <laughs> but uh, immersive entertainment, which combines AR, VR, and, and the artists that you were talking about. And I think, um, you know, you yourself are very poetic. Are you consider yourself an artist of kind? Yes, I do. Uh, I consider writing to be an art. Yep. And uh, yes, I definitely do. And I enjoy, you know, I enjoy working with media very much. Um, I noticed Marty Perlmutter is here. Marty and I used to work with video and cable TV uh, back in the dark ages. And uh, I've been doing it ever since. Uh, but, <laughs> you brought the light. You always brought the light. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Marty. But um, I'm first and foremost a writer, and, and uh, you know everything proceeds from there. Yes, I've known Marty a long time as well. Well, we can't wait to see the next book and hear from you more and uh, see you more. Obviously, um, and John, you want to come back on? Let's Let's come back on. I think uh, it'll be great to see what the, even between now and April, what the evolution of, is of this dialogue uh, for our Space Tourism Conference on the 28th and 29th. And obviously we hope all of you come and join uh, us there. And John, you wanna take us out? Sure, I, first off, this is great. I love the questions you've asked and, and uh, Frank, your, your, your answers. Uh, we're going to work collaboratively forever, and we're going to build up both the Overview Institute and our Space Tourism Conference and a number of the other groups around. We have momentum, we have purpose, and the future is going to be very bright, and we're going to be a part of that. So I want to thank everybody for being here, and I want to thank uh, Frank for his uh, Bernie impression. That was uh, <laughs> pretty impressive. <laughs> Done with great respect. It was yes, spot sure. on, actually. Right. <laughs> but thank you, everybody, for being here. And thank you, Frank, so much for sharing your time and your wisdom with thank us you. and your enthusiasm and passion. That's what we're all about, passion for the future. Yep. Thank you, absolutely. Allison and John. My thank you so much, guys. We'll see all you right. next time. Bye -bye. Thank you, Ivan. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you, Ivan. Ivan. <laughs>